So imagine you're dealing with someone who's hoarding. Now, people who are hoarding are often older or neurologically damaged or they have obsessive compulsive disorder. But then you walk into their house and there's like 10,000 things in their house. There's, 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 there's maybe a hundred boxes and you open up a box and in the box there's some pens and some old passports and some checks and their, their collection of silver dollars and some hypodermic needles and some dust and, you know, a dead mouse and, and, and there's boxes and boxes and boxes like that in the house. It's absolute chaos in there. Absolute chaos, not order. Chaos. And then you think, is that their house or is that their being? Is that their mind? And the answer is, there's no difference. There's no difference. So, you know, I could say, well, if you want to organize your psyche, you could start by organizing your room. If, they, if that would be easier, because maybe you're a more concrete person and you need something concrete to do. So, you go clean up under your bed and you make your bed and you organize the papers on your desk and you think, well, just exactly what are you organizing? Are you organizing the objective world or are you objecting your field? Or are you organizing your field of being, like your field of total experience? And Jung believed that, and I think this, there's a Buddhist doctrine that's sort of nested in there, that at the highest level of psychological integration, there's no difference between you and what you experience. Now you think, well, I can't control everything I experience, but that's no objection because you can't control yourself anyway. So the mere fact that you can't extend control over everything you experience is no argument against the idea that you should still treat that as an extension of yourself. So you could say, well, let's say you have a long-standing feud with your brother. Well, is that a psychological problem? Is that him? Is it a problem in the objective world? Or is, is it a problem in your field of being? And it's very useful to think that way, because you might ask, what could you do to improve yourself? Well, let, let's step one step backwards. The first question might be, why should you even bother improving yourself? And I think the answer to that is something like, so you don't suffer any more stupidly than you have to. And maybe so others don't have to either. It's something like that. You know, like there's a real injunction at the bottom of it. It's not some casual self-help doctrine. It's that if you don't organize yourself properly, you'll pay for it. And in a big way, and so will the people around you. Now, and you could say, well, I don't care about that, but that's actually not true. You actually do care about that. Because if you're in pain, you will care about it. And so you do care about it, even if it's just that negative way, you know. Um, it's very rare that you can find someone who's in excruciating pain who would ever say, well, it would be no better if I was out of this. It's sort of pain is one of those things that brings the idea that it would be better if it didn't exist along with it. It's incontrovertible. So you get your act together so that there isn't any more stupid pain around you than necessary. Well, so then the question might be, well, how would you go about getting your act together? And the answer to that, and this is a phenomenological idea too, it's something like, look around for something that bothers you and see if you can fix it. So now you think, well, let's say, there, let's say you go into a, you can do this in a room. It's quite fun to do it just when you're sitting in a room, like a room, maybe your bedroom. You can sit there and just sort of meditate on it and think, okay, if I wanted to, spend 10 minutes making this room better, what would I have to do? And you have to ask yourself that, right? It's not a command, it's like a genuine question. And things will pop out in the room that you know, you like there's a stack of papers over there that's kind of bugging you and you know that maybe little order there would be a good thing. And you know, you haven't, there's some rubbish behind your computer monitor that you haven't attended to for like six months and the room would be slightly better if it was a little less dusty and the cables weren't all tangled up the same way. And like, if you, if you allow yourself just to co consider the expanse in which you exist at that moment, there'll be all sorts of things that'll pop out in it that you could just fix. And you know, I might say, well, if you were coming to see me for psychotherapy, the easiest thing for us to do first would just be to get you to organize your room. You think, well, is that psychotherapy? And the answer is, well, it depends on how you conceive the limits of your being. And I would say, start where you can start. You know, if, if something announces itself to you, which is a strange way of thinking about it, as in need of repair, that you could repair, then, hey, fix it. You fix a hundred things like that, your life will be a lot different. Now, I often tell people too, fix the things you repeat every day, because people tend to think of those as trivial, right? You get up, 
you brush your teeth, you, you have your breakfast, you know, you, you have your routines that you go through every day. Well, those, those probably constitute 50% of your life. And people think, well, they're mundane, I don't need to pay attention to them. It's like, no, no, that's exactly wrong. The things you do every day, those are the most important things you do. Hands down. All you have to do is do the arithmetic. You figure it out right away. So, a hundred adjustments to your broader domain of being, and there's a lot less rubbish and there's a lot less rubbish around and a lot fewer traps for you to step into. And so that's in keeping with Jung's idea about erasing the dis once you've got your mind and your emotions together, and once you're acting that out, then you can extend what you're willing to consider yourself and start fixing up the things that are part of your broader extent. Now, sometimes you don't know how to do that. So you might say, imagine you're walking down Bloor Street and there's this guy who's like alcoholic and schizophrenic and has been on the streets for 10 years. He sort of stumbles towards you and, you know, incoherently mutters something. That's a problem. And it would be good if you could fix it, but you haven't got a clue about how to fix that. You just walk around that and go find something that you could fix because if you muck about in that, not only is it unlikely that you'll help that person, it's very likely that you'll get hurt yourself. So, you know, just because while you're experiencing things announce themselves as in need of repair, doesn't mean that it's you right then and there that should repair them. You have to have some humility. You know, you don't walk up to a helicopter that isn't working and just start tinkering away with it. You, you have to stay within your domain of competence. But most of the time, if people look at their lives, you know, it's a very interesting thing to do. Uh, I, like the, I like the idea of the room, because you can do that at the drop of a hat. You know, you go back to where you live and sit down and think, okay, I'm going to make this place better for half an hour. What should I do? And, and you have to ask, and things will just pop up like mad. And it's partly because your mind is a very strange thing. As soon as you give it a name, a genuine aim, it'll reconfigure the world in keeping with that aim. That, that's actually how you see to begin with. And so if you set it a task, especially, you have to be genuine about it, which is why you have to bring your thoughts and emotions together, and then you have to get them in your body so you're acting consistently. You have to be genuine about the aim, but once you aim, the world will reconfigure itself around that aim, which is very strange. And, and it, it's, it's, it's technically true. You know, the best example of that, you have all seen this video where you watch the basketballs being tossed back and forth between members of the white team versus the black team. And while you're doing that, a gorilla walks up into the middle of the video and you don't see it. It's like, you know, if you thought about that experiment for about five years, that would be about the right amount of time to spend thinking about it. Because what it shows you is that you see what you aim at. And that man, if you can get one thing through your head in, as a consequence of even being in university, that would be a good one. You see what you aim at. And so because one inference you might draw from that is, be careful what you aim at, right? It, what you aim at determines the way the world manifests itself to you. And so if the world is manifesting itself in a very negative way, one thing to ask is, are you aiming at the right thing? Now, you know, I'm not trying to reduce everybody's problems to an improper aim. People get cut off at the knees for all sorts of reasons. You know, they get sick, they have accidents. There's a random element to being, that's for sure. But, and so you don't want to take anything, even that particular phrase, too far. You want to bind it with the fact that random things do happen to people. But it's still a great thing to ask. Okay, so Rogers was a phenomenologist, and he was interested in, he didn't start his philosophy from the perspective of subject versus object, or from the idea of psyche, like sort of inside you, your mind with its layers. That's not how we looked at it. And so, let's go through, well, I'll introduce you to Rogers, I think I'll, and then we'll talk about it more next time. I'm going to start, though, with something that I learned from him that I think was of crucial importance. And so, we'll set the stage for the further discussion with, with this, and, and I, I'm going to read it to you. Assuming a minimal mutual willingness to be in contact and to receive communications, we may say that the greater the con communicated congruence of experience, awareness, 
and behavior on the part of one individual, the more the ensuing relationship will involve a tendency towards reciprocal communication with the same qualities. Mutually accurate understanding of the communications, improved psychological adjustment and functioning in both parties, and mutual satisfaction in the relationship. It's quite a mouthful. What does it mean? Assuming a minimal mutual willingness to be in contact and to receive communications. Okay, we're having a conversation. I'm deciding I'm going to listen to you, right? That's different than peop how people generally communicate because usually when they communicate, they're doing something like, okay, we're going to have a conversation and I'm going to tell you why I'm right and I'll win if you agree. Or maybe you're having a conversation where I don't know what you're trying to do. Maybe you're trying to impress the person you're talking to. So you're not listening to them at all. You're just thinking about what you're going to say next. Okay, so that's not this. This is, you might have something to tell me. And so I'm going to listen on the off chance that you'll tell me something that would really be useful for me to know. And so you could think about it as an, as an extension of the Piagetian... You know, Piaget talked about the fundamental... The fundamentally important element of knowledge being to describe how knowledge is sought, the process by which knowledge is generated. Well, if you agree with me and I find that out, I know nothing more than I knew before. I just know what I knew before. And maybe I'm happy about that because, you know, it didn't get challenged. But I'm no smarter than I was before. But maybe you're different than me, and so while I'm listening to you, you'll tell me something I, wouldn't, I don't like. Maybe it's something I find contemptible or difficult, whatever. Maybe you'll find, you'll tell me something I don't know, and then I won't be quite as stupid. And then maybe I won't run painfully into quite as many things. And that's a really useful thing to know, especially if you live with someone and you're trying to make long-term peace with them, is they're not the same as you. And their way they look at the world and the facts that they pull out of the world aren't the same as your facts. And even though you're going to be overwhelmed with the proclivity to demonstrate that you're right, it is the case that two brains are better than one. And so maybe nine of the 10 things they tell you are dispensable, or maybe even 49 out of 50, but one thing, all you need to get out of the damn conversation is one thing you don't know. And one of the things that's very cool about a good psychotherapeutic session is that the whole conversation is like that. All you're doing is trying to express the truth of the situation as clearly as possible. That's it. And so, now, Roger's proposition, and I'll tell you why he derived it, was that if you have a conversation like that with someone, it will make both of you better. It'll make both of you psychologically healthier. So there's an implicit presupposition that the exchange of truth is curative. Well, that's a very cool idea. I mean, it's a very deep idea. Uh, I think it's the most profound idea it's the, it's the idea upon, Western civil, upon which Western civilization, although not only Western civilization, is actually predicated. The idea that truth produces health. But for Rogers, that was the entire purpose of the psychotherapeutic alliance. You come to see me because you want to be better. You don't even know what that means necessarily, neither do I. We're going to figure that out together. But you come and you say, look, things are not acceptable to me, and maybe there's something I could do about that. So that's the minimal precondition to engage in therapy. Something's wrong, you're willing to talk about it truthfully, and you want it to be better. Without that, the therapeutic relationship does not get off the ground. And so then you might ask, well, what relationships are therapeutic? And the answer to that would be, if you have a real relationship, it's therapeutic. If it isn't, what you have is not a relationship. God only knows what you have. You're a slave. They're a tyrant. You know, you're both butting heads with one another. It's a primate dominance hierarchy dispute. Oh, I don't know. You're like two cats in a barrel or two people with their hands around each other's throats. But you, what you have is not a relationship. So, all right. We may say that the greater the communicated congruence of experience, awareness, and behavior on the part of one individual, that's, that's a reference to the same idea that I was describing with regards to Jung. So let's say you come and talk to me and you want things to go well. Well, I'm going to have to more or less be one thing. Because if I'm all over the place, you can't trust any continuity in what I say. There's no, and you, there's no reason for you to believe that I'm capable of actually telling you I'm capable of expressing anything that's true. 
So the truth is something that emerges as a consequence of getting yourself lined up and beating all the What would you call? All the impurities out of your out of your out of your soul